I got to a point where I literally could hear a voice inside of me saying, you can do more, you can do more. I had heard it as clear as a bell. I'm not saying it was divine inspiration or whatever. For me it is because it wasn't me who <laughs> was saying this voice. This is In Good Faith, listening to first-person experiences of faith and belief. On In Good Faith, it's our privilege to hear stories and accounts from believers told in their own words. Our hope is to listen with an open heart, celebrating the power of faith and belief and what those stories mean to the ones who tell them. Today on In Good Faith, I'm coming to you from the Cathedral Church of St. Paul in Boston, Massachusetts, speaking with Bob Greiner, who is a deacon at Emmanuel Church, not far from here, also an Episcopalian church. Bob, thank you for speaking with me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to this conversation. I wonder if you'd take us back to your very earliest memories of church or religion or any awareness or teaching of God in your life. What was that? Well, actually, there are two. My youngest memory was when I was in elementary school, and we lived in housing. We were a very poor family, and two women came and asked if they could have Bible study in my apartment or my house with my mother and father on an afternoon Wednesday after school. My mother said yes. So we had Bible study there, and I remember enjoying and immensely hearing about the journeys of St. Paul and all the biblical stories. So a lot of young people grew up with the Hardy Boys. I grew up with St. Paul (laughs) and loved it. How old were you? I was probably about uh, 10, just to say in the early elementary schools. I moved off away from that area when I was in the fourth grade. So this would have been in third grade, second grade in that area. And the other thing was that um, Assembly of God folk were also come around the neighborhood, and I enjoyed it because they would pick us up in a bus and take us roller skating on a Friday evening. That's a whole other meaning to holy rollers. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) But it was a wonderful way to be connected as a young person in the church. And then after that, when we moved away from Atlantic City, where I grew up, I worked, or I went to Wesley Methodist Church where my grandmother was active. And that was really the foundation for me. I love the Methodist Church, and we had services on Sunday morning. We had evening worship, Sunday vacation Bible study, just activities, which I'm not sure any of your listeners out there will remember something called like the Strawberry Festival, which were annual celebrations of the months of the year. It was a very, very happy time, very, very good time. So in all of this, there's lots of social connection, obviously, enjoyable for for a young person. At what point in your life did you start to feel like you really believed in God or made a connection with the divine? Well, early on, it's, you know, it's hard to say. Towards the end of my uh, study for the diaconate, I've been ordained for three years now, There's an author from England, his name is Francis, F-R-A-N-C-I-S, Spufford, and it's called Unapologetic. And in the book, he uses a phrase about whether there is a God or not and so forth, but he said he always had the sense of being observed. So from earliest time, I've had a sense of being surrounded by or someone nearby that I would call the divine or God. So my journey has almost been a kind of a companionship. I know I'm in a church that uh, really specializes in formal worship. You know, we do processions probably better than anybody. But at the same time, my relation is almost, um, not almost, it is kind of a conversation with Jesus or, or with God just at most times. So not sure if that's answering that question, but that's sort of the strain that's been running through my life. That sounds, uh, maybe I would call that living in prayer, to have an ongoing dialogue. Yes, yes. So it's uh, less centered around formal private prayer and devotions and more about this personal encounter sort of with the divine, with Jesus that, that happens throughout every day, which is not to say that I don't have encounters. I mean, it's also special times of 
of uh, picking the Psalms or a passage from Scripture and just sitting with it and, and in a sense, listening to what is being said and open to just realizing that sometimes it's good to take language that's traditional or holy because it helps me move into a holy space. So the reading of the Psalms or a story of the, the sacred scriptures or prayers from our Book of Common Prayer, which is the Episcopalian prayer book, there are wonderful prayers in there that help me move just beyond my own personal situation with, with Jesus or with the divine. So when we left you as a young person, you were last in the Methodist <laughs> congregation, yes. making your journey onward. Maybe tell me where that led you and why a few years ago it was time to become part of the clergy. Well, very early on when I was a Methodist, I would help with communion. And so I would be one of the ones that come early and slice up the bread in tiny little cubes and prepare the trays that had the bread and then the, uh, the little glasses of grape juice. And at some point, I just thought there's something more to this than just a memorial, that somehow I believe that, that Jesus becomes present when we're gathered for bread and wine. So I ended up, because of my sister's journey, joining the Lutheran Church. So I really enjoyed having Eucharist or communion every Sunday in a more mystical way than just a remembrance so I'm not putting that down in any way as being inferior by any means. It's just I felt there was more to that. And so I became more active in the Lutheran Church. Eventually, I ended up in the Roman Church, Roman Catholic Church, because I had a desire for worship every day and not just Sunday. But that has its own little deviation to the story, if I might tell you about it. Sure. When I was in college, which was in 59... Through 62 was high school. Then at 62, I went to the American University in Washington, which was Methodist-related. And I started to have a real crisis of faith. Part of it is that I, my faith would be more, as we understand now, fundamentalist kind of faith. It wasn't, a, as so often today, judgmental, but it was a literalism, let's say. And in my studies, discovering that Moses perhaps did not write the Pentateuch word for word, that was deeply disturbing to me. And I felt literally, and other things I was learning, I felt that the flooring under me was going aside. I ended up talking to my counselor and actually withdrew from college at that point. So there was a friend of a friend of a friend who uh, was a pastor at a Lutheran church in southwest New Jersey who put me in touch, and I interviewed to be a parish worker in New York City with the Reverend John Newhouse, and there was a great deal of social activism. It was coming out with marches for integration and so forth. And at that time, one of the people involved was Abraham Heschel, who was a very famous rabbi and teacher and scholar, and I think he was head of yeshiva. And I didn't know at the time that he was a well-known author, but I thought, this is such a man of faith. How could this man not be in heaven? You know what I mean? How could it be only someone that followed Jesus, per se? So it was began a real kind of difficult journey for me of trying to think that more people are involved in God's kingdom than just the limited community that I was brought up to believe. So that eventually led me into more active role in the church. For many people in a situation like that, some people just throw up their hands and say, you know, I just need to live my life. I can't really deal with this. I'll just withdraw. Why did you not? I don't understand it, but um, I have used this phrase often that I thought in some ways the church was stifling or perhaps killing me, to use to be extreme. At the same time, the church became a community that saved my life because it provided the direction for me. I wasn't aware of what the direction necessarily was at that time. Now, the, the one thing I wanted to say, and um, trust, not sure how this is with your viewers, but at the same time, I was coming out as being a gay person, okay? So very early on, uh, realizing literalism was just not working, 
And who was I as a gay person? I didn't know that. It was early. It was before a lot of the social movement and, and support we have now. That's totally lost, okay? So within the Roman church, it became very clear that they were not accepting. So there was one morning in 1989... It was a Gay Pride Sunday, and I was going up the steps to my Jesuit church, and I said, I can't go in anymore. And a friend of mine went to a nearby Episcopal church. And so I went there, and I thought, wow, this is church like I like it. It's like the sacrament. And they were inclusive. And I thought, this is wonderful. And a further extension of that was that it was the beginning where you would more often see women at the altar. And so hearing the feminine in worship was just so moving. So the Episcopal Church became my home. And at that time, there was struggle. A lot of folks didn't believe that gay and lesbian people should be included, and some did. My bishop at the time, Bishop Grind, said, well, I'm here, all people are in my flock. So that was the first time I kind of felt included. So I continued my job, which was in publishing, and I decided that I had enough of that. I'm 76 now, so it was pretty much when I was 66, and I started working at the cathedral. The dean of the cathedral thought I'd make a good receptionist. I got to a point where I literally could hear a voice inside of me saying, you can do more. You can do more. I had heard it as clear as a bell. I'm not saying it was divine inspiration or whatever. For me it is, because it wasn't me (laughs) who was saying this voice. And that's when I began my journey towards the diaconate. So in that service, what connects you with the divine, or what is most satisfying about that? Okay, in the traditional role of the diaconate, which was a role created in the early church, it first appears in Acts chapter 6, when there was the need that the women and widows were being neglected and the apostles were preaching and praying. So they decided to select seven men and make them deacons. And so their role was to be servant and supportive, allowing the apostles to do their work. So I do kind of the servant work, which allows the priest or whatever to do their apostles' work. So the idea of being sensitive to people who may have not been fully accepted as I was not fully accepted, and people who were in, in areas of loneliness or just on journeys, I f- felt that kind of connection, and I wanted to enter in conversations with those folks. Before the bishop ordains a deacon, there's a line that says that we are to take the message of the gospel and the church to the people, but the deacon is to take the needs of the world into the church to make sure the church is not ignoring a need. So it's that role both inside and outside. I love that. I love it. It's become more fulfilling that I get to talk with folks, support maybe a ministry, that I see a parent that I can help shape. Because deacons are not to be leaders, but they're to be supporters and, and help lift up you know, a ministry and provide the needs. So for me, this is truly where I feel called and where I feel at home. Being 76, ordained at 72, when a lot of people are re- retiring, I feel like I'm just getting going, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Every Friday for about 19 years now, we have Muslims that worship here. They have no mosque downtown, so the cathedral invited them to worship on Fridays. And to engage with that community, not just because I'm a deacon, but anyone of goodwill, it's to find ways where we can celebrate our faith in common. We're both children of Abraham. And so without putting a Muslim faith down or saying that mine is superior, it's, it's where you build a community of love and respect. So, for example, every year at Thanksgiving, because the Muslims are so grateful worshiping here, for our community meal, they buy all of the turkeys, about 27 of them, cook them all, all the fixings, and come and serve them. So we sit down and have a Thanksgiving meal uh, with all kinds of folks, including Muslims, families. uh, And I somehow think that that 
is what, in our tradition, I would say, I think Jesus would be happy with that. And at Emmanuel Church, um, we also share space with a reform temple, Jewish reform temple. So I've become very active there because if, if you have gone to a Sabbath service, a Shabbat service, um, you'll find it, as I found it, very similar to uh, many of our evening prayers. And so for a group that is feeling a lot of anti-Semitism at this moment and sometimes fear, uh, they are very grateful that the church, the Episcopal Church, is supporting them. And I feel very good about having um, the, sort of this covenant relationship going. So one specific way is, for example, for the High Holy Days, um, um, the Jewish folk there would uh, check people in at the door, making sure no strangers are coming in that might be an issue and so forth, but they were missing out part of the service. So the vestry of the church, we decided that we, as Episcopalians, would go and do the registration and check in so the Jewish folk could be inside for the services. And that worked out beautifully, that relationship. So what happened after that was that members of the temple came and they ushered for our Christmas Eve service and handed out the candles to make sure everybody uh, had a candle and joined in singing Silent Night. It was beautiful. And then they came uh, back again just a couple of weeks ago and helped usher for Easter morning. So that kind of beauty of living in, in your faith um, and trying to just uh, expand this community of love, you know, is, is, has been wonderful. So this is, it, this is a wonderful, perfect way of, of my ministry. It's just not trying to f change people's minds to do things, but it, it changes people's hearts. And that's as important as whether or not they could change ideology or religion or something like that. You may have explained some of this already in those, those comments, but I was wondering, how do you think you live your life differently because you believe in the divine? Um, it, it, living in the divine, in the sense of the divine, is, is life altering in a way, especially if you're in a specific ministry such as the diaconate, because it's not part-time. I just don't go to church on Sunday and I have a specific liturgical role or I'm going to Shabbat or something. It's 24 hours, so that the, the, the sense that I am um, in a formal way representing the church or the kingdom moves to all areas. So I might not wear my collar all the time, um, but I find ways of connecting um, connecting areas to help me and other people see that uh, there is something of the divine in so many situations. Now, one example, um, I don't have a great voice by any means, but I love musicals, and very often I find the divine in musicals. So when I had a recent sermon, I sang a song from Anyone Can Whistle, which was an early Sondheim musical. And, and I sang the song because it helped me uh, in my uh, meditation. And somebody came up after the service and said, I love that. Now, I think it's called Under Pressure. Uh, it was a song by David Bowie. And she pulled up the lyrics on the internet and said, this is, look at these words, this is sort of my devotional. And so I s said that this is true. And I wanted to point this out in my sermon. Not all inspiration comes from accepted religious sources that the divine creeps up in lots of ways. And so there must be something wonderful about David Bowie and his life who wrote this that allows you to be connected to a deeper sense of the divine in your life through 
this particular rock lyric that's not a hymn or not a religious poem. So there are these ways that, that connect. You mentioned that several years ago feeling this almost a voice inside you saying there's more that you could do. Maybe that's one of these, but are there events or experiences that are signposts to you that really there is a God, there is a divine? Yes. I, one of the first times I was sort of aware of this is when I first became an Episcopalian, the rector had us write our spiritual autobiographies. And so often I said, you know, I'm not sensing God in necessarily when I sit down in church on a Sunday morning. When I wrote my spiritual autobiography, which I re- recommend for every listener, I could see God's hand in the past. I could see a pattern. And that was very affirming to me, without a doubt, of God's present in my life and a little nudging here and there, perhaps, or a little saying no in other ways, you know, that ultimately led to me to be in this place. Because sometimes you want something and you may ask for it, pray for it, wish for it, and it doesn't happen. And at a future point, you may look back and say, I'm so glad that didn't happen because you you see a larger sense of the good taking over, that perhaps what we want in the short term is not what is good in the long term. One thing I have struggled with, um, and I'm not unique in this, and through the three years of deacon school I talked with our theologian about this, I have real ongoing concerns with evil. There was a rabbi that worked with the church while I lived in Florida who said because of the Holocaust he could no longer believe in either an all-powerful or an all-loving God. And those are good questions. If God is totally good and totally loving, how is so much evil permitted in the sense? Personal questions like in the Holocaust, yes, people died and so forth, but personal question for me is, why for five, six, eight, ten years did not God directly intervene to, to stop this slaughter of 16 million people? Well, six million, but when you add the whole war and the whole world and other places, and I don't find an answer to that. So when people ask about just horrible things that happen in their lives, I don't have an answer. I can't say it's okay. I, I find answers like, he or she's in a better place. I, I find those very shallow answers that, that don't really address what people are feeling. So for me, the most I can do at this point is that when there's something evil that happens, just to be a companion with someone who's experienced thing, that tragedy, maybe the sudden loss of a loved one or you know a six-year-old that dies of cancer or something like that. I don't have the answers, but just to be with him because the question of evil is just very difficult for me and I don't I can't supply an easy answer is there something I should ask you that I don't know to ask well I think for people who are engaged in a ministry perhaps people who are ordained ministry part of the thing is what do you do that keeps your health in shape in good shape your mental health kind of thing and that's very important because when you're devoted to a ministry, it can be all time consuming in a way. And I'm, I don't mean to represent myself as someone that is passionately engaged all the time, you know, that I'm a saint, so to speak. It's nothing like that. But there are times when you really have to maintain your health. And so when they were asking me this question early on before I was formally accepted, my answer was what keeps me in health mentally is a murder a day <laughs> you know and I thought I thought my bishop at the time was gonna what? <laughs> okay bye you're gone but for example for me I love mysteries so if late at night I watch murder she wrote it kind of first of all it takes me out of my setting and it introduces me to a world where there is black and white and rules and bad things happen and at the end good triumphs, and all is resolved. So that's not very dissimilar to a baseball game or a football game or a basketball game. You go there, it's chaos, there are rules. It may not be the one you want, but somebody wins, it's clear cut. And that kind of exercise really 
helps me out of some of the mental busyness of the day and gives me sort of like a brief vacation, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, the end of a sports event is usually pretty unambiguous, right. like life. It's very clear cut. So, and I don't, I don't take the image too far, but I think it's important that we step out to find something that we can engage in that a kind of cleanses us in a way. If you restart your computer, a lot of the memory is there. But if you shut it down, it clears out all the RAM and things like that. So there's a way I think we all need to every day find a time where we can shut down, clear the RAM, and then start up again. Deacon Bob Greiner, I'm really glad to sort of reset my memory here with you. <laughs> Bob Greiner is a deacon at Emmanuel Church in Boston, and he also works here at St. Paul's Cathedral Church, the Episcopalian Church, right off the Boston Common. Thank you so much for speaking with me today in good faith. Sure, and thank you, Stephen. I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to In Good Faith. That's our time for today. And thank you to our guest, Deacon Bob Greiner from Emmanuel Episcopal Church in Boston, Massachusetts, for generously sharing his stories and his faith. You can hear this and all of our interviews on demand at our website, byuradio.org slash ingoodfaith, or subscribe to the podcast. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. Email us at ingoodfaith at byu.edu. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you join me again soon, right here, In Good Faith.